great. Thanks. Okay, I, <clears throat> I think for me to tell you what God's been telling me, because whatever I have to say, I could t- they could assign me anything, and it's going to be whatever God told me last. Um, I did grow up during a revival. I, you know, what became the vineyard started when I was 17 years old, and it um, was an experience. I had been raised in a Quaker church, and I don't know if anybody know what that's like. It was Yorbel and the Friends, and it was basically an evangelical church, and you know, we were pretty close to Baptists, except we didn't baptize anybody, and we didn't take communion. But that was about the only thing that made us different than the Baptist church around the corner. We were very evangelical, and we basically believed God. But at the age of 17, I had, was tired of it. There was nothing there. I, nobody admitted they ever had any sin. They all pretended they were perfect. And I knew that I was full of sin. And I knew that I was up to no good, that give me a chance, and I'll, I'll get myself in trouble. So... I and my best friend started going from church to church. And then my dad, who had been gone, my dad, who was working for Fuller as a church growth expert, traveled around the country and told everybody how to make their churches grow. All of a sudden, he's talking about starting a church, and I'm going, but dad, I don't don't want to go to your church. You know, I'm already mad at you. You know, you haven't been here, and you want me to... So I was not enthusiastic, to say the least. And what made it even worse is I heard that he was speaking in tongues now. Because he had given me such grief when I had gone to a four-square vacation Bible school and that everybody was speaking in tongues there. It didn't like it. So anyway... So when the whole, that's kind of where it started, but God did something different, and eventually he melted my heart. Well, God's been doing that again. He's been melting my heart. And I will talk more into the microphone so you can hear me better. I don't, I don't like my voice amplified. I don't think anybody does. I'm, I'm not a public speaker, if you figure that out. Yet. I, I, I was part of the ministry team. I was one of the people that gives words of knowledge. I was prayed for people. I saw lame people walk, blind people see. I got to experience the intense movement of God that scared us. We were the ministry team. We were a bunch of kids. The church, the average age of the church was always whatever age I was. So when I was 22, that was the average age of the church. That includes my grandmother all the way down to the babies in the nursery. Just all averaged out. So the bulk of the church was always young, high schoolers, um, matter of fact, a lot of people, a lot of people tried to dismiss the church growth because most of the people that were coming from the church looked like a fashion show. This was when Rockabilly, I was noticing the Gretsch guitar. This was when Rockabilly was coming real big. And so everybody was dressing like the stray cats. They all had pompadours and, you know, the, the buckled shoes and the whole, you know, pegger pants, you know. And the, but God was showing up more and more powerful. And, um, we experience something that doesn't make sense. Now, I want to let you know, a lot of people assume that my dad planned this. No. Part of, part of what the reality is, my dad would have wanted this. He would have never wanted to be the leader of a movement. He didn't want it. He, would, he was doing it out of obedience. He was an obedient Christian, not a happy Christian. He wanted to do big band music. He wanted big band worship. He wanted to have, like, you know, the the Count Basie of worship bands. And for him, it was something that he was obedient. He taught on healing, not because he believed it, but because the Bible said it. He, He believed in miracles because 
he couldn't see how it made sense any other way, didn't say that they were, dispensationalism didn't make sense to him anymore. And he'd heard people that he really trusted talk about that it was real. So all this was happening, and then the revival started. And we were a, we were a church, and we were a mobile church, and we'd get kicked out of the school or we were meeting in or something midweek. So we had no way of telling anybody who, where we were. And so people, but more people still showed up next week, even though we had no way of telling anybody where we were. And eventually we got to a place where the average Sunday attendance was in the thousands and um, people would get delivered by walking in the back doors. Um, people, would, people would come forward and ask to get saved just after the service. There was no altar call. They'd just say, I, I, I need this. Whatever you have, I need this. And it was God, and it was God. See, the whole point was it was God. My dad used to talk to my mom. My, remember, my dad was a church growth expert. So he'd say, you don't, you don't understand Carol. My mom's Carol, Carol Kay. Um, he says, you don't understand Carol. We're, there's no cause and effect here. We're doing everything wrong, and yet the church grows exponentially. We're, we're not doing anything right. This is God. But see, what, what the truth is, my dad knew how to do churches. He was the church growth expert. He had the church I was, my parents got saved into, was about 250 adults. And he personally saved about 500 people into the church. By, he, was a, he was a salesman. He, he was a salesman for a collection agency. So that, 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 that puts a spin on it, doesn't it? He was a salesman for a collection agency. So he'd go into doctor's offices and lawyer's offices and you know, various professionals' offices and talk to the receptionist and whoever else would listen to him. And he had Bible studies that he taught. And, and so he personally saved about 500 people in the church. And between that and going door to door every every weekend, as he was taught to do as a young Christian, he, it was his church. It was this huge church. So he knew how to do, do it the, the, the common way. But he had hurt, he'd been hurt by the ministry. And if, you're, if you've ever been in the ministry for any length of time, you know the ministry will hurt you. It's a very painful thing because you pour your life into people and they bite you. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> for my dad, it was, he was very happy working for Fuller and traveling around the country. And then God kept telling him to go plant a church. And he goes, but I don't want to. And he, God, they don't even like me. So anyway, the story goes, and if you know much about any story, the, the one story that went around the most was... Um, my dad got stuck in O'Hare Airport, snowed in. You know, the only airport I've ever been snowed in, O'Hare. That's the one everybody gets stuck in. He was stuck in O'Hare, and if you know anything about getting stuck in O'Hare, there's not a chance in the world you're gonna get a hotel room. Because it's where it's at, and because of how big the airport is, that's way too many people to find any hotel. So he was stuck in the airport, he was snowed in, the plane wasn't gonna take off for another 10 hours or something. Um, he didn't know exactly when, so he said, oh, God, just get me out of this. I'm just so tired. Just get me, just please. And then he, uh, a half an hour later, he found himself in a hotel room. And he was so thankful that he finally said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray, and I'm going to thank God. I'm not going to pray to open a meeting. I'm not going to pray for any other reason, but I'm just going to thank God. And so he got down on his knees to thank God and fell asleep because he was so tired. And then was humiliated that he couldn't even stay awake long enough to, to pray so he climbed in bed, and then God woke him up and said, okay, John, I've seen your ministry. Now I'm going to show you mine. And so what you don't understand, what a lot of people don't understand, is they think that he had a plan. He never had a plan. It happened to him. The vineyard movement, that whole thing happened to him. He didn't want to be a vineyard. We would have been a friend's church if they would have let us. We would have still been a Calvary Chapel if they would have let us. They had to let us, <laughs> you know what I mean? They didn't. So we became vineyard only because they let us. <laughs> yeah. 
And my father, my father was a lot of things. He was, he was very brave. He wasn't afraid of humiliating himself. He could stand in front of 10,000 people and without anything in his head and say, God's going to move and not know for sure he is. And God would move. And he wasn't afraid of making a fool of himself. Remember that first tape I was talking about, I'm a fool for Christ, who's fool are you? That was, that was the name of his testimony. That I, I, I was the video editor, so I probably made 100,000 of those videos. <clears throat> when I got to the end of my dad's life, he died um, 20 years ago in November. And you know, it's been a long time. I, it, it, it freaks me out. Um, when he got to the end of my dad's life, he was so disappointed because nobody could do it themselves. They still needed him to hear from God. That's what was most painful to him. But when the first thing that God started talking to me about, okay, I... I got it. I keep thinking I did, I got, and cut some of this stuff out, but I can't. <clears throat> when I was, uh, three years ago or so, my mom calls me up on the phone. My mom is since remarried, and she's, she's wonderful, and she's happy now, and she's, she married a doctor, and so it makes her happy because she understands doctors. Her dad was a doctor. And um, plus, he's a really nice guy. Um, and she calls up and says, Tim. I said, what, Mom? She says, you got to get ready. I said, what are you talking about, Mom? Did I, like, promise to do something for you? I said, no, you got to get in your place. My place? I'm sitting here in bed. What are you talking about? It's, it's 7.30 in the morning. What are you talking about? She says, you got to get ready. It's going, you got to get ready. The revival's coming. And I said, okay. Sure, if God calls, I'll be ready. Just went back to sleep, you know what I mean? I, I had no hope. Part of, part of it is, is that I'm old now. I thought I was called when I was 30. As a matter of fact, I really believed it. I was, I'm an ordained vineyard pastor, which doesn't do me any good. It doesn't get me coffee or anything. <laughs> I... I was really disappointed. It, you know, have you ever gone back to the house you grew up in and it, they've ruined it? That's the way the church felt to me. That's the way all the church felt to me. The fact that you have a worship band singing contemporary music, the, the fact that you're not all wearing suits and women wearing hats is because of my dad. <laughs> when we started, it was singing hymns written by the Wesley Brothers or songs of about that same era, and with pipe organs and pianos, and you know nothing as risque as a guitar, <laughs> and a drum set. Oh, that would have been just scandalous. Um, but there was a movement that started, and it seemed like everybody forgot what it was about, and it really disappointed me. So. People started talking to me, well, you know, there's going to do this, we're going to do that, and I'm going, nah, it's not going to happen. Nobody, there's nobody that knows how to fight for it. There's nobody that knows how to push through. There's nobody that's going to push into God to hear from him again. And it was really hard for me because it broke my heart. And I knew that I had tried, that I had done what I thought was right, and I had failed. Not because of I'd sinned. I hadn't done anything wrong. I, I just was stupid. I thought that I could do something for somebody else and make their church grow. But you can't do that. You've got to grow your own church or you've got to, or you've got to help him grow his own church. You can't, you can't grow somebody else's church. So I had failed and I had come back miserable, unemployed, back to, you know, away from Colorado to... Back to your Belinda. And I got to tell you, it's really hard going backwards to Southern California. It, it cost me a lot of money. And so I am a pool man now. 
That's what I do for a living. I clean swimming pools. I uh, repair swimming pools. I you know, do whatever it needs to be done. So when I started hearing about this or that, you know, this move, I'm interested because I love the church and I like to hear about revival and I'd hear about things going on in South America or, or anything else. And I was excited to hear it, but I didn't think I was ever going to be part of it again. I thought, okay, I had my chance. I really felt called. I knew that God had given me all these words when I was younger and I was supposed to do this big thing. And, it, and I thought, well, I made a decision. I made a decision not to hurt my family. I made a decision to let my kids grow up through school. I had said, I'm not gonna make my, I'm not gonna do to my kids what other pastors have done to their kids. I'm not gonna go try to chase the anointing. So I didn't, and so I thought, okay, I'm just gonna be happy with my grandkids, and I'm just gonna sit here. And then this, this crazy prophet guy shows up and tells me that I'm supposed to do this thing, and I'm like, oh, sure. Everybody has told me I have my father's anointing. I'm so tired of hearing people say that. I don't have my father's anointing. I'm nothing like my dad. This is me talking, okay? So I can say that. If any of you think I'm my father's anointing, you're wrong, but you can think that. You have your right to your opinion. I have the right to mine. I am not John Wimber. I'm Tim Wimber. And... The, the point is that for me, I had, to, I had to get back to the well. Nobody was going to the well anymore. We were all living off of other people's books, other people's teachings, other denominations, other movements' teachings. We were becoming seeker-sensitive and, and, you know, whatever the other words were at the time for how to do church nowadays. And I had nothing to do with it. I wasn't part of it. I didn't go to the pastor's conferences. I wasn't invited. It was sad to me because so many of the key people, I'd watched them just fold their churches up and do other things. And they, they stopped taking any chances. They stopped calling down the Holy Spirit. They stopped trying to save people. They stopped trying to do anything. They became a social club to me, and I'm, that's probably pretty severe, but that's the way it felt. They weren't taking any chances. They weren't living by faith. So anyway, this, this prophetic guy comes through and tells me I'm supposed to do this thing, and I go, oh, sure. But he talked to my mom, and my mom calls me up and says, Tim, I gotta talk to you. Okay, now r realize my mom... If everybody thinks that my dad was the visionary, no, it was my mom. My mom, we call her the oracle of the vineyard. She was the reason why the vineyard started. She, she and I told you, she called me up the other day, get, get ready. You know, it's been about three years, but other day to me. And she, she's the one who prays in revival, and she says there's one coming. So she talks to me, she, she, we meet at a really bad steak restaurant, and I'm a foodie, so I, I hate bad food, but I, I put up with it because she was paying. And um, we, she, she apologized. She said, your father and I prayed against you being in the ministry. We didn't want you to go through all the pain of being a pastor, and so we prayed against you. And I go, no wonder I had worked, I, I'd, I'd get a relationship going with some leader in the church, and all of a sudden they'd drop us like a hot potato, and they wouldn't ever tell us why. And um, until there was, finally I met, I was working under a guy named Richard Clinton, and he finally told me, he says, God told me not to touch you with a 10-foot pole. And I said, oh, I never knew what happened. <laughs> I never knew. Well, God had, basically my, God had honored my dad's prayer which really just screwed the crap out of me. I mean, it was just terrible. <laughs> I, was, I was cursed by my dad's prayer, well-meaning. He, you know, remember, he didn't want to be a pastor. So he didn't really like it, but he was obedient. See, that's the point. Get back to it. He's obedient. 
So anyway, something changed. Something was different. It was like driving down the car, and all of a sudden, somebody pushed the button in the sunroof re to retract. And all of a sudden, I can see heaven. All of a sudden, I can hear God's voice. More and more and more, the conversations I had with God were like two-way. I would say something, he'd say it back. And you know it's God because he says something different than what you believe. You know, I, I had decided that the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to make it easy. I'm, God, I need $3 million. I need $3 million because if I had $3 million, I could, I could invest it. I'd have enough money to get a building, and I could do this thing, and, and I'll, I'll serve you, and you know you can trust me because I'm not going to take the money and spend it on myself. And, I, and he says, I'm not giving you $3 million. I said, why not? You got it. And he says, because then you wouldn't need me. You're supposed to live by faith. Oh, oh yeah, that's right. God had showed me when I was a young Christian. Sharon and I were just married, and um, we had had one little boy, Christian. He's now 33, so it was 33 years ago. And um, we were meeting in somebody's house, and God showed me that I was at the, I was like at the edge of darkness, like chopping away with a sword at gauze. And I couldn't see the next step in front of me, but I was having to go forward. And I could look back and I could see the light, but I couldn't see anything in front of me. And he says, this is the way it's going to be for you. You're always going to have to be hacking away at the darkness right at the edge of the light. And I thought, God, it didn't mean, it didn't mean anything to me then. Unfortunately, it isn't a lot to me now. I, I, I kind of wish that I hadn't gotten that one. But what, what's happened is, is God has more and more and more showed me what everything means. Somewhere about that same time, I had a vision. And most of us are not satisfied where God put us, right? Don't we think that we should be, you know more involved and more the center of focus in ministry and we should be able to do all these things. Well, I thought the same thing. I mean, after all, come on. I know, I know more about all this stuff than my dad. I, I, I could write all of his notes better than he could. Matter of fact, I, a, a number of articles that were attributed to my dad, they were me. But I wrote a thing on small groups that got published under his name, which cracked me up. Um, well, it was Wimber, it just wasn't John Wimber. <laughs> the, um, in this vision, I'm, I am thread, and I'm next to other color threads, and I'm not happy with the threads that are around me. And I'm, not, and I'm thinking, this doesn't look like anything. And what is it? God, what are you doing? And you're not using me. I could, there's all this empty space. There's nothing but orange. And I could be part of that. And I could do something. And I have something. And, and this is all part of the vision. And then God pulls back and shows me that it's like a medieval castle. And it has this big tapestry hanging down the wall. And the whole thing together is beautiful. But we're threads. We don't get to know what's happening. God lives. Remember, we were talking about this morning that God, time was created in God. God lives outside of time. God, God is bigger than time. So we're going through time. He's not. He looks at everything that has happened. To him, it's all present. He's omnipresent. He's there all the time. He's there throughout all history since everything is within him. God is the answer to any question. What holds together the universe? God. You know, everything is like that. So I didn't like it. I didn't like it that I wasn't getting what I want. And I think a lot of times we don't, we don't really realize that he has the plan. How many here, you know, all things work together for good? We all say that, right? We were all Christians. We believe that stuff, right? Do you believe it? I don't think you do. I think you kind of like, that's what you say when things aren't working out the way you want them to. It was his plan that I died after going to Colorado. It was his plan that I, that I would sit out for 20 years. It was his plan that I wouldn't know why. It was his plan that my father 
uh, you know, was born into a heathen family. Um, my dad was a musician. And when he got saved, he knew nothing about Christianity at all. He'd never, he said, as far as he knew, he never met a Christian. At least they didn't blow their cover in front of him. Okay. So he knew nothing about God. Now, my mom had been raised Catholic, came from a nice Catholic family when they were still doing the masses in Latin. So she didn't know a lot about God because she didn't know Latin. But she was one of six kids in a Catholic family. So she knew a little bit more than my dad. So for them to come together, it was easy for them to get drastically saved because they didn't have any barriers. There wasn't anything holding them back from getting drastically saved. My parents had to do that, met a man that saved them, and the only reason why my dad would have listened to him is because Gunner, Gunner Payne was his name, was because my dad had heard about him because his, his only daughter had been raped and murdered four or five years before my dad met him. In Orange County, a transient had come that somebody had picked up, brought to their house, to a house that she was babysitting at, and they, she, they killed her. She, he killed her. And Gunner, now Gunner was, Gunner was a real man, okay? I don't know how to explain it. He was a welder, heavy construction kind of guy. He was, you know, you go over his house and he had lots of tractors, and as a little boy, I loved that, you know? And he went up and found the guy, didn't beat him up, and went and witnessed to him every day until they executed him. Went through the trial, and the, the person that had killed his little girl, Ruby, she was 16. During the time that my dad and mom were young Christians under his care, in his group, his only son got in a terrible car accident, nearly killed him, to the point he was permanently disabled the rest of his life. Yet, did Gunner complain? No. Matter of fact, Gunner was aware enough that after he took care of all the things he could, he went and made sure my parents were all right. A different kind of Christian. That's who my dad got saved under. That's what he thought a Christian was. Now, how many of us are, are that mature? Not many. At least, okay, I'm talking for myself. I'm sorry, you're all that mature, but not me. When, uh, when my dad was told, do this thing, A lot of people would think that he's John Wimber and, you know, he, he liked it or he liked the visibility. And I'm sure that like any man, I'm sure there were times he liked it that People recognized him and gave him a better seat in the restaurant. But I don't, I honestly don't think he, I, I, I think if God had told him at any point, give it all away tomorrow, he would have. He had a thing in him. You know the, the parable, the pearl of great price? What does it say? It says a pearl merchant, somebody who knows pearls, founds the pearl of such immense value that he sells everything he has to buy the pearl. That's the way it is every time. You have to give up everything and you don't know that you're gonna get it. You don't know it comes next. You have to sell everything. My dad was a musician. My dad quit his job, quit, gave away all the royalties when he didn't have another job, he didn't know that what he was going to do. He just knew that music was for God. He'd started a band called the Righteous Brothers. You know, you lost that love and feeling, you know. 
Little Latin Loopy Lou was his, their first big hit. Um, you know, uh, Unchained Melody. What, what other, I can't think of any other Rice Just Brothers songs, so forgive me for not being up on my dad's music. But he was, he, he was the person to put the band together. He was the, all the instruments on the albums. He produced it, arranged it, did everything. It was his stuff. He had three albums, the top 100 in Billboard, and then walked away. Gave away all of it, didn't take any of it, didn't keep any of the royalties, didn't keep any, any of the performance royalties or anything. He got no money from him anymore. Gave it all away. Just walked away, no reason. Didn't sell it, didn't do anything else. He just walked away. And I can remember we had a, 65 Colony Park station wagon, the only car we owned that had a bad battery. My mom used to have to pray on the car every morning to get it started. Um, but my, my um, dad was, try, was, was doing the last thing he could. He had a box of his arrangements. He was an arranger. You know? I mean, he'd written scores for movies and stuff. And every once in a while when we were really desperate for money, somebody would play Crystal Palaces or whatever it is that he did. And... Uh, he would get $150 or something because it was played on a local TV channel for the, his score of the, of the movie. And he, he takes a box of all of his arrangements, takes them to the dump, and literally just kicks them out and then drives off crying because that was his world. That was everything. But he gave it all up and had nothing to go to. Now, he got a job. He got a job as a welder's assistant. He, he, it was a, he was a grunt. He was a peon. He was nothing. He, he, literally, um, he literally did things like clean out the oil barrels and took out the trash and handed, handed welding rods to the welders. He was nothing. And, but his, he didn't know how to do anything else. He'd only ever been a musician. He got his union card when he was 14, and so he gave that up. That's the first time. Then he... God... You know, gave him another job. He had all these, he'd saved hundreds of people, literally. He was doing, teaching eight to ten Bible studies a week. He was doing all the stuff God was providing for him. And then he really felt like he was supposed to go on staff at the church we were going to. He gave it all up again and got fired from the church. So... He thought, well, now would be a good time. I'll go to Fuller. So he went and started going to Fuller, figuring he better get educated since he seems this is going to be his vocation. And so he worked for Fuller, started developing all the stuff. And then eventually, God tells me he's got to go start a church again. So he has to give it all up. But see, that's, that's the point. The, the point is that we... We have to learn to hear from God ourselves, for ourselves. Alan can't hear from God for you all the time. That's not, that, this, it, better that we all be prophets, right? Isn't, isn't that what, they, what, what Samuel said about Saul? Wouldn't it be, we all prophesy? Wouldn't it be better we all hear from God? We spend so much time you know, I, I, I don't want to step on any of your theology. Everything is depending on hearing from God. Anything you do is dependent on hearing from God. If I'm going to raise the dead, if I'm going to pray for somebody's hangnails, I still have to hear from God. If I'm going to prophesy or if I'm going to walk on water, I need to know. See, a lot of people make fun of Peter for being kind of way out there, but he got to walk on water. He did. Do you want to walk on water? You're going to make a fool of yourself if you do, but I think it'd be worth it. Every time I try to walk on water, I fall in the pool. So <laughs> remember, I'm a pool man, so. A lot of people have spent their whole lives thinking, well, God, you're not making, you're not, you're not using me. I'm so good at this. You should let me do this thing. I'm not good at this. God's telling me to do it. 
God always chooses the wrong person for the job. I am not. This is the last thing I want to do. I hate standing up and talking in front of people. I know I'm just going to make a fool of myself, and I usually do, so it works out. And sometimes I try just so that I won't accidentally do it. When, you know, I was thinking about it, God waited till I thought I was over for me, and then he came to me. And the first thing he tells me is, is he gives me the picture of Moses. Moses is out there herding sheep. He's 80 years old, herding sheep. He's on, literally on the backside of the desert. That's how it's described, right? He's on the backside of the desert next to the mountain. And all of a sudden, a bush is burning. It won't burn up. And he's just like, this is really weird. So he goes up and looks at it, and it turns out to be God. And the first thing he says is, wait a minute. I can't even talk. He says, well, take Aaron with you. It's like, God isn't going to change what he's going to do. If I was good at talking, I don't think that he would let me do this. Do you, I mean, think about it in, in the way this. God took Peter and sent him to the Jews. Peter was a construction worker. He was, a, he was, he was crude. He probably cussed a lot. I don't know. I didn't say he does, but I just assume he was probably very offensive to people. He was rough. He was a fisherman. He was a professional fisherman, and he was, like I said, pretty brash, not educated. He, Paul, who the Jews would have just, he was a Pharisee. He was the most educated. They would have naturally given him all this respect. He sent him to the Gentiles. Now, you know, the picture I have of Paul is probably short with a hook nose and a hunchback and a, you know, just, a, just not a very attractive man. And he sent him to the Gentiles. Because, see, I am dependent on God. Standing up here, I have to be dependent on him because I'm a, I have all this fear and all this stuff. And I have to make sure that if I say something, God gave me to say it. Because I don't have anything of myself. I cannot, I can't, <laughs> I can't fake it. There's nothing to fake. I don't have anything inside me that I, you know, I, I don't preach enough. I can't throw together something. Although I did this, so don't, that's a lie. I'm sorry. Forgive me for saying that because I haven't, I haven't talked about anything I was supposed to talk about. But I had, I, the whole thing about, about, um, you know, the, the tapestry, that was what it, God had showed me this morning and I was supposed to talk about. God speaks to me now like a conversation. That's not normal. He tells me things that have no outside value except for our relationship. This is, this is not like my supervisor telling me what to do. This is like my brother telling me what's going on. This is like my friend putting his arm around me and saying, see that? See what's going on there? Isn't that, isn't that different? Do you, you know what's really going on here? And telling me things. Why does he do that? Why did he wait till I was 58? Why, why, am, why did I spend all those years? Don't know. Does it mean all the other things are happening? Does it mean all the other words that people have given me? I don't know. And I don't really care anymore. And, I, and if this is the last thing I ever do because of this word, that's fine with me. I just want to be obedient. And I want to see God do it again. I told you that for me, looking at the church in general and most of what I, I would include your church and, and other churches like it in, is that we are, the next revival will be in the streets. It won't be in buildings. The next revival will be you going out and people will run into a group that there's a Christian here, I need a Christian. That means you need somebody raised from the dead, healed, fed, saved. What else, what else do we do? We, those are the things we do. 
we will be, they won't ask you what church you go to. They'll ask you if you're a Christian. And there'll become a time where that the power will be so amazing, it'll scare us. Because he's God. He's God, and he's not limited. I've already had the experience, you know, a couple times in my life where I raised my hands up to somebody to pray for them, and they'd fly across the room and be delivered, healed, and everything else without me ever even touching them. God is like that. God will expect that of us. It's his ministry. We can't do anything. When Robbie comes up here, and, and he, he's the guy who's going to give out words of knowledge and heal people and do all this stuff, he and I both know that if God doesn't show up, nothing's going to happen. We can say we're going to do it, but it's not us that does it. It's him who does it. It's, it's when... What, <laughs> there was a conference in Harrogate, England, and I was video. Remember, I'm always sitting in a video truck watching a screen someplace. So I was sitting in a video truck in the back room, and this was a leadership conference, and um, my father had given out a bunch of words of knowledge the night before, and nobody responded. And so everybody was, you know, kind of rebuking everybody, saying, oh, you've little faith, and you know, sinners, and well, you should respond to God, and whatever. And my dad finally, like, went and got the microphone away from him and said, wait a minute, I don't care. I don't have a different act. I can't do anything else. So if, you know, I, this is all by impression anyway. None of us, it, this is not like dictation from God. This is God speaks through us. Sometimes, I honestly believe this, sometimes God covers us and makes things happen just because we, we were, we were well-meaning when we said it and we thought it was true. So I think God will actually do some things just because we request it. Sometimes we prophesy over somebody or heal, you know, pray to, for somebody who's sick and God will heal them even if it wasn't his plan before. I think he just does it because he loves us and he wants us to feel good and he figures it's good if they feel good, you know. Revival's coming, and it's going to be amazing. Revival's coming, and it's not going to be in churches. Revival's coming, and we won't be, it won't be mercenary. It won't be us to build big buildings. It won't be for us to get a name for ourselves. Most people will never know who we are, but just this Christian guy or this Christian woman. That's the way it's supposed to be, because we represent him. When, the, when Jesus sent out the disciples... When they come back and say, you know, even the demons listen to us. They, okay, you've read the Gospels, right? Everybody read the Gospels? Did, did the disciples seem like they had it all together? <laughs> Ever. I want to let you know, this is not merit-based. You cannot learn how to do this better. You can't learn how to do supernatural better. It's always God. Now, what you can learn is to try to keep your shaking down so nobody knows how nervous you are when you do it. What you can learn is, is that, well, he's, he's backed me up before, so hopefully he'll back me up again. But I got to let you know, there's an enemy who's trying to stop you. And he's trying to make this embarrassment thing. I, like I said, I'm a pool man, and I do pools in a very expensive neighborhoods. Um, it's good because I make more money. But um, I was praying for somebody who was in a, uh, who, who had just moved into this $3 million house, and she was the most miserable lady I ever met. Her father, I think, made post-it notes, I think that's how, or liquid paper or one of those things, you know, like one of those office supply things, and she was still living off of the royalties from that. And big old house, and it's on the cliffs in Laguna Beach, and it's, uh, 
she's, she's fallen down the stairs and she's hurt herself. So I'm her pool man. So I see her and um, I said, oh, what happened? And she tells me, I said, can I pray for you? And she was so touched that I would actually come over and pray for her. So the worst thing that can happen is if you pray for people, they'll know you like them. Okay? You didn't say you were going to heal him. You're asking God to heal him. It's, for, it's between them and God. It's be, God can heal him if he wants. And you can pray even if you don't hear from God that he's going to heal him. The other thing that stops us is we think we're too big of sinners. We think we should be better than we are now. By now, don't we? We look at, God intensifies our sight. We see what wasn't sin is sin now because we're more sensitive to it. The more you hang around Jesus, the more you realize what sin is. And the longer we hang around, we think, oh, I'm just such a terrible person. I'm just such a terrible person. I shouldn't be thinking mean things about that person or whatever it is. I'm telling you, that's the enemy too. The enemy is trying to stop you any way he can. He, he can't stop you if you do it. He can't stop God from moving. He's an angel. We're a little bit higher than the angels. Remember that whole thing? We're created a little bit higher than the angels. We have authority. Jesus, the keys, the hell, Hades, remember that? We have the keys to the kingdom. We are his representatives. He's told us to do this. Jesus sent out the disciples. He sent them out two by two, told them what to do. If they don't accept you, just kick the dust off your feet and leave. Don't worry about it, basically. They don't have to accept you. But if they do accept you, good things will happen to them. Now, you get the point? The point is that we are to be his representatives. What would Jesus do? Didn't somebody write a book? Hey, I'm really sorry I don't have any books to sell to. I just thought I'd mention that. They, Ravi's got extra. With the whole sight of what's happening, we have to get ready we have to get over our fears. Face spell RSK, right? Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. Some of us are afraid to talk to our spouses. You know what I mean? We have to get ready to talk to people. You know what? Most people will accept Christianity, that it exists at least. Most people will even let you be a Christian in front of them. And those that won't, you, that you, are, you have all the power of heaven behind you to defend you. Nothing can happen to you if you're doing God's work. Now, th think of it this way. So you decide that you're going to be a traveling evangelist and because that's what you decide you're going to do. And God didn't tell you to do it, but you're doing it in the name of God. And you get to the first place and a, a lynch mob comes and kills you. Well, then you're in heaven, so you're happy. So that's the worst. Okay, that's the worst extreme thing, okay? So you're in heaven. So that's pretty good. So anything less than that is be, has got to be better than pretty good, right? So, so just think of it that way. The enemy has done a really good job of taking the church and winding it up in a bunch of Religion. And religion is not, is not Christianity, okay? And I, I, I'm not saying that for any other reason. There's a reason why we want to be better. We want to be better because it embarrasses us that we're bad. We want to be better for him. It isn't, it isn't that he needs us to be better. He knows who you are. He knows everything you're ever going to do wrong, and he still wanted you. He's not living, he's not going through time with you. He is looking from outside of time. Our God is big. Our God surrounds everything that there is. He's not surprised when you screw up. 
you're surprised when you screw up. You have to not let that stop you because why should you stop doing the good thing? Because you did the bad thing. Why should we not be Christians in God's representatives? I've had so many people tell me that they decided they're just going to blow it. They're going to fall off the wagon. They're going to go get drunk. They go in the bar and they end up witnessing the people all night. I don't, I don't suggest that. To, it, it's much better to go to the AA classes, okay? God is a merciful Loving God, he wants you the way you are. You don't have to change to be his. You are his. He made you the way you are on purpose. Now, we can wonder why he made us the way he did. I suppose that's valid. We can wonder, but he doesn't wonder. He knows exactly why the way you are. Remember the tapestry? Any individual color looks really weird if you try to take a tapestry apart. And it looks terrible. It looks like weird shaped clumps. But altogether, it is the image of the church. Do not hate anything that God is God's. Don't ever badmouth any other church movements. Don't ever badmouth any other Christians. Don't tell Jesus his bride's ugly. Don't do it. Love everyone. If you think that there's a particularly bad doctrine out there, you can pray about it. But probably not in your weekly prayer meeting. You should probably pray about it yourself. If your, your immediate disciples get into something you think is dangerous and you, you see a problem, then they're your disciples. You, you can talk to them about it. If you're the pastor of the church and you see something you think is a destructive doctrine, that's between you and your church. But if it's the church next door, don't talk bad about the church next door. Just talk about the doctrine. We have to be the united body of Christ. If we are not that, then what good are we? Nobody, you know, wouldn't it be nice if our bride has all of her fingers and toes and her legs, and wouldn't it be nice? It makes it a lot easier, right? I have from the, you know, because of Hal Lindsey's book, I've been waiting for the second coming, right? It, it, was that too obscure for people? Okay. Um, I honestly believe that revival is coming again and it's not going to be like in the past. I see, God shows me this, okay? I'm a, I'm a seer person, I see things and I can remember every vision he's ever given me. And I can go back into my mind and look at every little nuance of the vision still, of anyone that, whether it was 30 years ago or last week. It's, it's got imprinted, I don't know. Um, God showed me that the book of Acts was the church. All these amazing things were happening. We're moving into that again. We're moving into a time where I don't have any money. Hey, but stand up and walk. They're not all drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. You know, there will be people walking into places and changing the world by what they say and do. Remember, the enemy doesn't know what's going to happen. I, I, I kind of checked this out with, with Alan and Robbie. I think the devil didn't get it, didn't get the cross. He thought he'd won by killing Jesus. He didn't get it. He was blind. Well, in um, Romans 9 says, uh, I hope I can find where I had this. 
It was really good. I really liked it. Um, Well, I thought it was so good too, and I can't see it. I'm blind now. Anyway, it basically basically says, "I will I will harden people's hearts, and I will, you know, I'll do what I'm going to do." It's me. I would never thought it was fair that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, says that, so that he could send more plagues. I mean, does that bother anybody else? Okay. He's God. It's his world. He's God. We, we don't have a problem of thinking too high about ourselves, okay? Most of us don't get it. We just don't realize how high we should think of ourselves and what position we've been put in. We don't value what God's made. We don't value what God's done in us. We don't value what he's trying to do in us again. We set up limitations that are artificial. They're not real. What's the worst thing that can happen? You don't have to raise anybody from the dead. You don't have to, but you, but you have to ask. Because that's what you do. You're a Christian. What did Jesus do? He asked, and it worked. Now, if we ask and it doesn't work, we did our part. We asked. The vineyard, when it was learning healing, prayed for two and a half years, and nobody got healed. Every week. We'd all get sick praying for sick people. A lot of people were really tired of praying for sick people. And then people started getting healed. And then there were periods of time where we, we purposely would scan the room looking for the sickest person we could find. Because we knew in, in, in the next few moments that anything we asked for would happen. I mean, if we could, we would have ran to the morgue just because we wanted to see somebody raised from the dead. I mean, we were kids. We were idiot kids. You know, you can't, can't blame us. We're stupid, you know. But 20-year-olds, you know. But we we would look for sick people because we didn't want to waste the moment on somebody's, you know, somebody's um, headaches or something, you know? I mean, not that headaches are not need to be healed. I'm just saying that we, we wanted to have big ones. We wanted to have lame people walk and blind people see. We wanted to, you know, have people hear, cured of incurable cancers and stuff. And we knew it would happen in those moments. And you knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that anything you asked for at that moment would happen. And it felt like we couldn't move fast enough to get to those people. Those times will come again. Pretty soon, we'll live like that for weeks at a time. Pretty soon, that will be our lot in life. Don't forget it. Don't forget that in the middle of that, you're still the same person. Don't forget in the middle of that, that God does not approve of you because he's using you. Do not forget that you are still his if nothing happens or if miracles happen. It is this, we, we have to not change. We have to remain humble. We have to, because if we, what happens if we don't remain humble? We crash and burn. He's not gonna crash and burn, he's God. He's just gonna use the next person who's humble. This is a prophetic conference, and I, I, I would not consider myself a prophet, okay? God speaks to me, so, but I think God speaks to everybody. I, I asked God once, well, God, I knew all that. How come he's a prophet and I'm not? He says, that's his job, not yours. So I'm not, that's not my job, so I don't get to be a prophet. But I do want to let you know that we have a God who reveals himself to us. We have a God who wants to tell us who he is. We have a God that needs us to press in. God doesn't speak louder to me than he used to. It's not clearer to me than it used to be. 
it's still quieter. I have to get quieter still. I have to turn off the thing in my head that drowns out his voice. I have to do it. And I'm not, I'm not proud of the fact that I have so many voices in my head that would want to steer me away from what God would want me to do. It was... <laughs> Robbie's very gracious in the way he talks about me. I'm sure that I, he, he wishes that I could be a lot more flexible, but I have to, like, pay my rent. And, you know, I, I'm not rent, but I household payment. You know, I have to make thousands of dollars a week just to be able to survive where I live. And so because of that, because of everything else, I'm not very available to him, you know? I think he'd like me to go with him everywhere and do stuff. I don't know, at least that's what he says. He, he may just be doing this to try to kiss up, thinking he's going to get points in heaven. I don't know. <laughs> and I don't know why I said that, because that makes no sense. I, I should be hanging out with him so I can get points in heaven. Okay, this is the last thing. We are all just men. All the people you see that are in leadership, we're all just men. We're no more than that. We're no less than that, but I mean, we're just men. Well, all people in leadership, people. So, excuse me, women, if you thought I was being male-oriented. Moses was a man. Moses was the most humble man that ever lived, according to Scripture, right? Right? Abraham was a man. Now, read about Abraham in Romans. He's the man of faith. Did he seem very faithful in Genesis? Did he, didn't he seem like he struggled a lot? But the final outcome is where he ended up. At the end, he believed. We need to believe. And this, don't worry about your unbelief before. Worry about tomorrow and the next day and the next day. You don't have to be anybody special. I'm nobody special, I promise. I don't know how else to describe it. I'm doing the same job I did in high school. I was a pool man in high school to make gas money. I'm a pool man now and I pay my, my mortgage with it, you know. Um, houses are expensive in California. That's why I talk about mortgage all the time. <laughs> You're lucky you live here. Amen, brother. At the end of the day, we're all called. We're all called to be representatives of him. Your sphere of ministry will be different. Some of us are called to talk to lots of people in lots of places. And that's what we're called to do, okay? Okay. Some of us are called to do specific kinds of ministries. And that's, that's fine. But I want to let you know that God could do anything he wants through you at the moment he wants you to do it. God has used me to do things that I don't have that gift, you know. We all talk about, I don't have that gift. But God's done it. You know, like I said, I keep wanting to walk on water. That's the one I keep, it never happens. But the, you know, God has used me to interpret tongues when I'm not that person ever do that. God has used me to do inner healing, and yeah, I suppose that makes sense, you know, because healing and inner healing, they're all kind of the same, huh? And God has, you know, used me to heal people with terrible physical injuries, and God has given me words for people that were encouragement, and God has had me walk up to people and tell people on the street things. And that's not who I want to be, <laughs> so I, I don't know if that's, I hope it's not my ministry, because that scares the crap out of me, I don't want to have to do that. But I will, because I'm telling you have to, so I have to. God is the God who's going to do miracles. God is a God who's going to do miracles through you. God is a God that's your God, he's your personal God, get to know him, hear his voice. If you look through, read through the Gospels as fast as you can, like you're reading a book, 
and realized that Jesus healed people all different ways of the same things. You know, blind people were sometimes sin was what caused them to be blind, but sometimes it was just a physical thing. Sometimes it was his parents, and sometimes it was, you know, whatever else. I can't remember all the things. But the point is that you have to know how to pray, and you have to hear from God. We have a God who speaks to us. God will speak to us personally about things in front of people. And sometimes, remember, he speaks really quiet. Sometimes we have to listen. I would encourage you, now this, I'm sorry if I'm offending anybody. I would think the thing that I would really value is that we can learn to pray and then be quiet and listen. I'm a Quaker, remember? Quakers sit in on the pews. I could hear, I could still remember growing up. We had a regulator clock, made a really loud tick in the back of the church. Hardwood floors, wood pews, because I remember, tuck, tuck, tuck. 20 minutes, I'm five. My feet are dangling and, you know, like that. And, but I, I, but I knew that the presence of God was there. Listen for God, he wants to speak to us. Talk to him, let him talk back. God speaks to me now, and I'm not saying this is normal, okay? I'm, I'm, I keep, I, every time I say that, I'm afraid it'll never happen again but God speaks to me like a conversation now. Yeah, it can happen. It's happening to me. I'm nobody special. I'm cleaning the pool in Three Arch Bay, and God's speaking to me, telling me things that I don't believe. And I'm arguing with him. Are you sure? That can't be the way it is. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Robbie try to make this into a ministry time. <laughs> and I don't, I'm not saying he has to, be, but I know that, okay. I just want to pray over all of you, okay? Is that all right? Yeah. Lord, I ask that you would right now speak to everybody here. Come, Holy Spirit. Lord, in as much as I can give away, you've given me, Lord. I pray that they would know your presence. I pray they would hear your voice, that you would wake them up and tell them the secrets of what's around them that you would give them insight on how to pray. You would give them insight into how to help people. Lord, put love in their hearts for those around them and make them pray for people. Make them have intercessions for people. Lord, give them opportunities to bring your love to people. Lord, give them the patience to wait for your voice.
if any of you are feeling the presence of the Lord and you want me to pray for you, come forward now. I, I'm, I don't know if any of, any of you are feeling like I do, but I can't hardly stand up, so. Holy Spirit, we ask right now that you would come and you would change us, that you would show us where the lies of the enemy has come in and you would block that. Lord, I pray you would change us inside, that we would be faithful. Lord, that you would change us inside and make us see the lost, make us see those who need you. Lord, we're sorry that we're so self-absorbed. Lord, we're sorry that we, that we don't see what you see. Lord, give us your eyes. Give us your eyes. Lord, we can't do anything unless we see it. Lord, give us the opportunity to pillage hell to bring to heaven. Give us the opportunity to bring those you love into your kingdom. Lord, anybody, everybody, Lord. Lord, do not put inside of us just a resolute thing that no matter what the enemy says, we won't stop. Lord, Lord, we will wait for you. Lord, we want your presence. We want your presence in our lives. We want you to speak to us. We want you, we want the awareness of your presence all day long. Lord, and we will wait for you. We will wait and you will give us this thing, Lord. Lord, give us your presence, Lord. Lord, let us hear your voice. Let us hear, feel your presence, Lord. Let us renew us every morning. Lord, do not let us fall into religion. Do not let us fall into habit. Lord, do not let us let other things get between you and I. Lord, I love you and I need you. Lord, I need your presence, Lord. I pray that we would be a people who hear your voice, that we know you. Lord, we're your sheep. Speak to us. Lord, we're sorry that we've let other things get between you and I, you and us. We, Lord, we, we're sorry for the things we've let occupy our attention that wasn't you. Lord, we're sorry for the times when we just didn't want to do it. Lord, I pray that your power would change us. Lord, that you would put a burning desire in us to do your work. That we could not hold back but to do it. That it would be the, 
that it would be the, the energy, that you would be the, the motivation that keeps us moving. If my people who are called by my name will repent and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. Lord, we are. We are turning towards you. We are turning away from our wicked ways. Please, Lord, heal our land. Lord, heal our land, Lord. Lord, you are a, you are a God who wants to do good things for us. Lord, you want to pour out your power on us. Lord, you want to pour out your mercy on us. Lord, you have all, and you want to give it all to us. Lord, in as much as you've given me authority, Lord, I pray that you would impart that thing here in this church that will drive people towards you constantly. People would walk in the door and want to know you better. People would walk in the door and seek your face. Lord, that people would not want to be known as much as they want to know you. Lord, that their motivating factor will not be famousness. They don't want to be famous. They want to make you famous. If uh, you just see the Spirit on somebody, just reach over and just bless it. Just reach over and just say, more, Lord. Just stir on them more. Just reach and put a hand on them. 
So many times we want to receive something, and one of the best ways to receive is by blessing what the Father's doing in somebody else, and it's like sowing and reaping. Let's reach over and just put a hand on somebody and just begin to bless them. Let's say, stir it up more. Lord, more. Let's bless them. Yeah. And let's just finish out this session with just blessing each other and just praying an increase for what the Father's doing on us. No more words need to be spoken from here. No more stirring. The Spirit's here. It's moving. Just bless it and soak it up and receive it. Yeah. So more, Lord, for all of us. Take us deeper right now. Take us deeper. Keep praying for each other. Keep blessing each other. That's how we'll finish out.